Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. The treaty had quite obviously been broken, and now the Athenians made ready for war, as did the Spartans and their allies. Thucydides, after the incident at Plataea. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 72, The Outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. In Sparta, a vote had been taken on the question of if Athens had broken the truce of the Thirty Years' Peace. The Spartan Assembly had decided in what appeared to be an overwhelming majority that this was the case. The implication of this vote would see that war would be the next stage in this evolving situation that began with the affair of Epidamnus. We had seen that for Sparta to have been brought to this stage of having to vote on this matter, their largest ally Corinth, along with their own allies, would travel to Sparta to put forward their arguments for Spartan intervention, now that it looked as though their connection to Potidaea was about to be lost. Sparta not wanting to subordinate themselves to one of their allies and allowing them to dictate when a meeting in Sparta would take place, would issue an invitation to all the Peloponnesians who had been harmed by Athens' activities. This would see a general assembly being held in Sparta, where representatives from all those that travelled there would have the opportunity to air their grievances. Corinth, who from Thucydides' account, appears to have been leading the effort on convincing Spartan action, they would have their allies first address the Spartan assembly. Their aim, we are told here, was to set the mood for war before they would then stand to speak. Corinth would then stand and give what appears to be the main speech of the assembly. They would criticise both Athens and Sparta, focusing on Athens' imperial ambitions at the expense of other cities' freedoms, while focusing on Sparta's constant inaction. However, Corinth's focus on Sparta would be calculated, as they were in fact attempting to rouse the war party within Sparta to action, almost making them ashamed for the policies the peace party had set Sparta on the course of. The Athenians had also sent representatives to Sparta, although uninvited, they wanted to ensure that they could put forward their views on matters. Plus, having someone there to witness what was taking place would have served Athens well in future decisions that they would have to make. Athens, when raising to speak, would not look to defend themselves against the arguments of Corinth and their allies. They would instead urge Sparta to think long and hard about what they were deciding. They would also highlight the power and influence of Athens to show how this would not be a straightforward war. After all these speeches had been given, the Spartans would dismiss all the visitors while they would decide amongst themselves the path they would take. This would see King Archidamus address the assembly, putting forward the sentiments of the peace party, looking to maintain the Thirty Years' Peace. However, a proposal to better prepare Sparta for war was suggested, so if the situation warranted it, Sparta would be in a far more advantageous position to go to war. Though the war party would also be represented when one of the E4s would also stand to speak. It appeared here that the war party's feelings for war were far more popular by this stage, as Archidamus' points would not even be addressed, but just a rousing speech for war was given. After all this had taken place, the assembly would put the matter to a vote. The war party would ensure that the clear majority in favour of war would be clear to all. After claiming they could not tell which side had won by holding their usual system of voting by voices, they would tell all present to stand on either side of the room, this making it very clear the decision made, as well as who voted for what. However, this would not be a formal declaration of war, but a vote on the direction of Spartan policy in regards to Athens. For war to be declared, a congress of the Peloponnesian League would need to be held. For this episode, we'll be turning to the events that would see a state of war develop. We will look to the Congress of the Peloponnesian League and the ultimatums sent to Athens. We will then turn to the initial actions with the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, this not laying with Sparta but one of their allies. So the Spartans had reached a point where it seemed that they would now go to war with Athens. 
After a number of threats for action over the past years, it had seen the restraint of the Peace Party, would have seen these threats not turn into action. But now, momentum was with the War Party, and they now turned to strengthening their policy for war. The first step that would be taken was to legitimise their position. This would be through one of the most important gods connected to Sparta, that being Apollo. The Spartans would consult Delphi on if the decision they had reached was the right course of action, with Thucydides saying, It is said that the god replied that if they fought with all their might, victory would be theirs, and that he himself would be on their side, whether they invoked him or not. With how important Apollo was to the Spartans, it would have been almost certain they would have invoked him to assist in the war with Athens. Thucydides account perhaps just attempting to outline how certain their victory would be. With the divine favouring Sparta's war stance, they now needed to gain support of all their allies within the Peloponnesian League, as they would need all the support that could be gathered in taking on Athens and its empire. This would see Sparta send to all the Peloponnesian League allies to dispatch representatives to Sparta for a congress to be held. Corinth, we are told, knew that this measure was being taken, and fearing that more delay in action may take place, would themselves send embassies to all the Peloponnesian cities before their representatives left for Sparta, where they would urge them to vote for war. It appears that a number of the coastal and interior city-states in the Peloponnese were somewhat reluctant in going to war with Athens. The coastal cities knew that they would be vulnerable to the power of the Athenian navy, while being economically disadvantaged. While the cities inland saw themselves removed from the current quarrels taking place. Plus, it would seem very likely with Sparta calling the Congress, the Peace Party back in Sparta would have ensured the arguments against war made by King Archidamus would have made its way to the other Peloponnesian allies. This would have seen that the arguments made in the speeches back in the Spartan Assembly now extending out to all the allies. Corinth and the War Party looked to make sure that the path to war with Athens lay clear, while the Peace Party saw they still had a chance of preventing or delaying it, if they could influence enough of the Peloponnesian League members. It would seem the key in the arguments being put forward rested on whether or not the Allies could be convinced that Athens could be defeated. It would be during the Congress in Sparta that these arguments would be tested. Once the Congress in Sparta was finally joined by all, a number of city-states that had put forward their cases during the Spartan Assembly once again spoke to help sway the opinions of those who had not been present. We then would hear that the Corinthians would once again make the final speech in attempting to convince all the members of the Peloponnesian League that war was the right choice. It would be in the speech that the Corinthians made that they would attempt to sway the reluctant coastal and inland cities. They did not need to worry about addressing the Spartans this time around, as they already had shown that they were in favour of war. The Corinthians would first turn to those Peloponnesian cities that lay inland, where they would begin by saying those who had already had dealings with the Athenians understood the dangers, with them then continuing with, but those who live inland far off the main trade routes ought to recognise the fact that if they fail to support the maritime powers, they will find it much more difficult to secure an outlet for their exports, and to receive and return the goods which are imported to them by sea. They should therefore consider carefully what is being said now, and not regard it as something in which they are not concerned. They must be prepared to see that, if the maritime powers are sacrificed, it would not be long before the dangers spread further, until they too are threatened, and that thus this discussion affects them just as much as it affects us. Therefore they should not shrink from the prospect of choosing war instead of peace. After showing how all the cities of the Peloponnese within the League had a stake in the war with Athens, the Corinthians then moved on to explaining why victory would be theirs, through practical explanation, and that Athens should not be feared as much as they are. There are many reasons why victory should be ours. First, we are superior in numbers and military experience. Secondly, one and all, and all together, we obey the orders we receive. As for sea power, in which they are strong, we shall build ours up from both the existing resources of our alliance and from the funds in Olympia and Delphi. If we borrow money from there, we shall be able to attract the foreign sailors in the Athenian navy by offering them higher rates of pay. For the power of Athens rests on mercenaries rather than on her own citizens. We, on the other hand, are less likely to be affected in this way, since our strength is in men rather than in money. The chances are that, if they lose a battle at sea, it will be all over with them. 
The Corinthians would also move on to other avenues open to them in combating Athens, where they would give examples of strategy that they could follow. These would include targeting the allies of Athens, where the Peloponnesians could foster revolts, thereby depriving Athens of resources to direct at the war. This would affect them in two ways. It would see that the revenue they received dropping off, while they would then be in a position of having to divert money, men and ships in attempting to put down these rebellions. On land they could turn to ravaging the countryside of Attica, depriving Athens of the resources gathered from within their own territory. To make this enterprise not so much as a burden on themselves, they could establish fortified positions within Attica, so they could maintain a constant flow of raids. The Corinthians would then conclude their talk on strategy with, and there will be other ways and means which no one can foresee at present, since war is not one of those things which can follow a fixed pattern. Instead, it usually makes its own conditions, in which one has to adapt oneself to changing conditions. However, we had seen last episode King Archidamus had countered these strategies when speaking in the First Assembly, with two of the main hurdles the Peloponnesians would need to overcome being, firstly, they would need a large and powerful fleet if they wished to support the rebelling cities and islands of the Athenian Empire. Not only would they need to keep contact with these islands and support them with men and supplies, but since many of these cities were in the eastern Aegean, they would need a fleet strong enough to defend against the Athenians who had naval supremacy in the region. While on the question of the proposed land strategy, Athens had a large trade network that they relied upon to feed their city. Depriving them of their own territorial resources would not bring them to their knees. However, many of the Peloponnesian League members had not been present at the assembly. The Corinthians wanted to present these ideas to show that there was a number of possible ways to bring Athens down. They were looking to give those doubters hope that they could win, plus providing what would have seemed as credible strategies would have shown their allies that much planning and thought was going into the enterprise. The Corinthians would then round out their speech to the Peloponnesian League members, reminding them that war was a necessary step, once again highlighting Athens' imperial ambitions. They would also stress the fact that all the Peloponnesians needed to stand united on a vote of war, as if they did not, Athens would be able to pick them off one by one and enslave them. If they joined together, in war, they would be as powerful, if not more so, than the Athenians, and could prevail over them. While they'd also point out that their cause was a just one, and even the gods had looked on them favourably, with the blessing for war coming from Delphi. With the conclusion of the Corinthian speech, the Spartans then arranged that a vote on the matter would now take place. During this round of speeches, we do not get any representations of the anti-war side of the argument in Thucydides' account. We only get a hint that there may have been some who spoke out against the war, in the line in Thucydides' work where he had said, Representatives came from all the Allied states and in a general conference put forward their views, in most cases attacking the Athenians and advocating a declaration of war. However, all the members of the Peloponnesian League would now cast their votes, where Thucydides' account would reveal that the Peloponnesians had voted for war in a very unsurprising manner. However, it appears that the vote and discussions that would follow from it would not be as straightforward as Thucydides presents, as the Peloponnesians had recognised that they were not in a ready state of war at the present moment. They would agree that they required time to make themselves ready for the coming actions against the Athenians. To do this, it was agreed that all members of the League should return at once to their cities and prepare their contingents without delay. However, this would not be an exercise of a couple of weeks or months but Thucydides would suggest it was nearly a year from this decision in Sparta to where war openly broke out. Though during this time of preparation, Sparta would send embassies to Persia, Italy and Sicily seeking assistance, while a number of ultimatums would be delivered to the Athenians. Before we move on to the embassies sent to Athens, I want to just highlight one point around the slow build-up to war. This is raised in Donald Kagan's Outbreak of the Peloponnesian War and is also featured in other modern histories. This highlights that the slow build-up might have had something to do with not all the cities completely convinced for war. Although a vote had seen a majority in favour, there may have been other cities still reluctant. This argument is put forward as it is thought that the plan that had been outlined by the E4s would have only taken a few weeks to put into practice. It's thought that even though we don't hear much about him around the Congress, King Archidamus and the Peace Party would have still been very active. 
I bring this up as it suggests that the decision in Sparta may not have been as united as it first appears. As we will see, Sparta was busy diplomatically during the build-up of force, suggesting other means of ending the war were also being considered. Or at least until they could get all the League members on board with the march to war. So let's first look at the embassies that were sent out to potential allies outside of the Peloponnesian League. We don't get much of a detailed account of what took place here, though Diodorus and Thucydides would both reference these activities. They tell us that an embassy was sent to Persia, where an alliance was sought. However, no answer to the Spartan request is provided. Though it would make sense for the Spartans to send an embassy here, as they would know full well Persia would be looking for an opportunity to gain areas on their western borders back again. Plus, for Sparta, this would see Athens having to commit resources to the Persian threat, which in turn would be diverted from what they would have to deal with. As we will see as we move through the Peloponnesian War, Persia will indeed become involved in the conflict. However, more from the sidelines, with their gold having an impact on the struggle. We then also hear of the Spartans sending embassies west to friendly cities in Sicily and Italy. Here we learn that they would be persuaded to join in the war, with Diodorus telling us that as a group they would commit 200 triremes, and will get ready their land forces while the Peloponnesians were also preparing their armies. I just want to point out that Diodorus represents these embassies taking place at the same time they are engaging with Athens, where Thucydides suggests they took place after the events around Plataea that we will get to at the end of the episode. This is about all we get on the matter, so let's turn to the embassies that would be sent to Athens. Sparta would also engage with Athens with a series of embassies. These embassies would claim to be an effort with a means of avoiding war. However, Athens must have been questioning how serious these attempts were, since they would have known full well that the Spartans and their allies had voted for war. On this point, I just want to highlight one thing that I've often thought about during these talks that had been going on in Sparta. When the speeches had been taking place, Thucydides' account uses the idea of voting that the Athenians had broken the Thirty Years' Peace and voting for war as interchangeable. However, I wonder if in reality these were two separate ideas. Perhaps it was clear from the Congresses in Sparta that the Peloponnesian League had agreed that Athens had breached the peace, but it may not be clear at this stage if it was agreed war was the appropriate action. Anyway, this was just a thought I had that separates the two points into their own issues and may also explain why lead up to the conflict was so drawn out. Thucydides being an outsider may not be fully aware of the details during the period and might have presented the decision in a more simplistic way, being able to look in on in hindsight. After all, for Athens, it made no difference once war came if these two points were separate matters. Anyway, let's get back on track. So, from Thucydides' account, it is clear that he saw that there was no way the Athenians could accept what the Spartans had to offer. His view was that these embassies and the ultimatums presented were an exercise in gaining a solid pretext for war. So we need to keep in mind, when reading Thucydides, this is the view his account is presenting. So as I said, there would be at least three embassies that would be sent to Athens before hostilities broke out. The first would demand that the Athenians drive out the curse of the goddess. This was referring to the period of Athenian history where Chilon had attempted to enact a tyranny. His attempt had failed and the supporters of his had taken refuge in a sanctuary, where they were then tricked out of hiding. They would maintain contact with the altar and were killed as they left, which would see that the understanding of the sanctuary had been violated. The members who carried out the killings were members of the Alcmionidae family, one of the most powerful in Athens. These killings would also see what was known as the curse of the Alcmionidae develop and had been used in the past as a political tool. The significance this time around was the fact that Pericles' ancestors were from the Alcmionidae. It seems Sparta was looking to remove the head of the driving force of Athenian policy. For Athens to agree to this ultimatum, it would see them having to exile all the Alcmionidae within the city, this including Pericles. Since these men held some of the most influential positions in Athens, this was never going to happen. The second embassy that we hear about an ultimatum that would supposedly see war adverted was to do with the current situation taking place around Greece. These having to do with the siege at Potidaea, Aegina's independence and the sanctions that had been placed on Megara. While the third embassy that we hear about would also appear to be a last ditch attempt and warning, war would result if not agreed to. However, the message the Spartans delivered 
comes across as an attempt that no one appears to have seriously thought would be acted upon. The embassy would present, the Spartans want peace, and there will be peace if you give the Greeks their autonomy. Do you want more Casting Through Ancient Greece episodes? Well, I have some good news for you. If you have been enjoying the series and wish to support the show over Patreon, you can gain access to many bonus episodes, with new ones being added each month. Not only will you be gaining more content, but you will be helping the series grow. These bonus episodes have been taking a deeper dive on subjects we have covered briefly in the series so far. We began at the start of the Greek timeline and have been moving forward, this seeing as having covered topics around prehistory, the Bronze Age and the Archaic Age. We are now turning to focus on the Greek and Persian War period, with us beginning with the Ionian Revolt. Here we'll be putting in focus through different episodes, the early contact between the Greeks and Persians, motivations behind the Ionian Revolt, the Persian counter-offensive of the revolt, and then a focus on the final battle of Lade. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access and ad-free series episodes. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website where you can find the Patreon link as well as other ways that help the series grow when clicking on the Support the Series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. Athens would respond to these separate demands that the Spartans would send. In regards to the first, Pericles knew all too well what the Spartans were trying to do with their propaganda around the Chylon affair. To this Pericles would hit back for the Spartans to do likewise and drive out their own curses, this referring to events of sacrilege during Sparta's own past. Pericles would propagandize two curses within Sparta, to give them a taste of their own medicine and calling them out on their own demands. The two curses Pericles would use were the curse of the Tanaris and the curse of the Brazen House. The first referred to a time when the Spartans had killed some helots who had taken sanctuary in the Temple of Poseidon at Tanaris. It was widely thought that this curse had also led to the earthquake Sparta had suffered in 465. This first curse seemed to mirror that of the one Sparta was demanding to be driven out of Athens. So for Pericles proved to be a very convenient one to use to embarrass Sparta. However, he wouldn't stop there. He would bring up another, perhaps in an attempt to show that Sparta had a lot more trouble with the gods than Athens did. This second one was to do with the downfall of Pausanias after the Persian invasions. After committing treason, he had taken refuge in a temple of Athena, where he was walled up and allowed to starve to death. Even the priests at Delphi had been insisting on atonement for this ever since it had taken place. In this first round of talks, it would be clear that Athens had come out on top, and it even seems that Pericles' response may have reignited debate in Sparta between the peace and war parties. By bringing up the affair around Pausanias, it had not only served to show Sparta had more troubles with the gods, but by highlighting the actions around Pausanias, this would highlight a point of divide between the two parties. It had been the actions of Pausanias after the Persian invasions, where we saw debate between the two parties develop and how Sparta should move forward. Pausanias' actions and his downfall would go some way into the policies of the peace party becoming more popular, due to the negative effects of Pausanias' moves. It may be at this point that we would then see Sparta return with their next embassies, perhaps some internal compromise in Sparta had taken place, as this time around they would come with more practical demands. It is thought that the first two requests around Potidaea and Aegina were too much to ask of Athens, who were strategically involved in both these regions even before conflict had occurred. Though it would be the last point around the recalling of the sanctions on Megara that Thucydides would focus on more than the other points, presenting to us that it had the most weight within these discussions, and perhaps showing it was the outcome around this point that would decide if war was to follow. Though what is interesting here is that if this was in fact a genuine attempt at avoiding war, it was so at the expense of Corinth, since it did not address their situation and the tensions that had been growing around the developments leading to the siege of Potidaea. Some have doubted this condition being the main focus, since it would dispense with Sparta's largest allies' interests and the reason for the current situation. Though we don't need to be so quick to dismiss this idea, 
As we have seen, Archidamus had been advocating for arbitration and settlement between Athens and Sparta, but Corinth's demands were not important. So it could be very likely that the Megarian Decree became the one focus to avoiding war if the Peace Party had been able to impose some influence back into Spartan politics. Very possible after the failure and embarrassment of the first embassy to Athens, as this policy was one that had a flow on effect economically to other Peloponnesian cities. Athens will respond to the second embassy once again by dismissing the ultimatum put forward. Thucydides' account makes it clear that Pericles was driving this policy forward. However, this time around, the rejection was not so straightforward. Sparta had come to Athens with actions that could be carried out in response to the current situation. While what seems to have made this a politically difficult decision to make in rejecting the proposals was the fact that the Spartans highlighted the Megarian Decree as the main hurdle which was also the least consequential to Athens' strategic position. However, Pericles seems to have been looking to reject all Spartan demands. Perhaps the implications here was that accepting to remove the sanctions was agreeing to all the demands, or relenting on one point would just see the Spartans push for more. This point comes up in Pericles' speech to the Athenian assembly when he says, If you give in, you will immediately be confronted with some greater demand since they will think that you have only gave way on this point through fear. But if you take a firm stand, you will make it clear to them that they have to treat you properly as equals. Pericles also spends much of his speech convincing the Athenians that Sparta has not once attempted to arbitrate the matter with Athens, but rather issued demands. This may be acceptable when dealing with lesser powers, but Athens was not this. If they wanted a favourable outcome, they would need to approach Athens on equal terms. He also outlines many reasons that Athens should not fear war with Sparta. Where the strengths of Athens' empire in regards to the resources that could be called upon were highlighted. He turns to describing the foe that they would face, outlining their weaknesses. In a single battle, the Peloponnesians and their allies could stand up to all the rest of Hellas. But they cannot fight a war against a power unlike themselves so long as they have no central, deliberative authority to produce a quick decisive action. When they all have equal votes, though they all come from different nationalities, and every one of these is mainly concerned with its own interests, the usual result of which is that nothing gets done at all. Pericles would also go on to addressing the likely Spartan strategies during the coming conflict. These would be what we have already seen outlined in the Spartan speeches. No surprises here, since it is Thucydides who puts these words into the mouths of both sides. However, Pericles would tell the Athenians that the nature of their empire, and the power and the experience that they had gained in naval matters, would counter the Spartan attempts to bring them low. It was clear that there had been support in Athens for the Spartan demand to cancel the Macarian Decree to be accepted. However, Pericles was eventually able to convince the majority that more demands would follow, and dissolving the decree was not Sparta's ultimate goal. The speech is presented by Thucydides as taking place after all three embassies had occurred, where at the end, a vote would be cast, with Thucydides telling us, Their reply to the Spartans was the one that he had suggested, both on the main issue and that of the separate points. That they would do nothing under duress, but they were willing, according to the terms of the treaty, to reach a settlement on the various complaints of a fair and equal basis. We then hear that the ambassadors would return to Sparta, and no more formal embassies would be sent, making any other demands or engaging in talks. Heralds from both Athens and Sparta would continue to travel to one another, though suspicion between the two would grow further, which would see, in its 15th year, the 30 years peace coming to an end, with now an excuse for open war to develop. It is unclear how much time passed between the final embassy sent by Sparta and the beginning of hostilities in the opening of the campaigning season in 431 BC. However, it appears with war on everyone's minds, this would see the end of the unofficial envoys travelling between the two cities. Even though spring of 431 would see the opening action of the Peloponnesian War, this would not be a result of either Athens or Sparta. The opening action would occur in Boeotian territory, with the city-state of Thebes, an ally of Sparta attacking the small polis of Plataea, a city friendly to Athens. As we have covered, this region of Greece had seen conflict during the First Peloponnesian War. 
There had appeared to be some sort of agreement between Thebes and Sparta that was a little difficult to get to the bottom of. However, after the conflict between Athens and Thebes in this region, Athens was able to stop Thebes from forcing all of Boeotia into a league under Theban control. Even though this had been prevented over a decade ago, Thebes' desire to spread their influence and become a power on the same level of Athens and Sparta had not disappeared. Thebes' first focus would be on the polis of Plataea, where relations, even during times of peace, were never that friendly. Now with war very close at hand, Thebes looked to put themselves in an advantageous position before war could develop, since Plataea stood on the road that led out of Attica, travelling to Thebes. An opportunity would present itself with those friendly to them within Plataea, where the Thebans would now put into action their plan on gaining control of the city. Thucydides would tell us, For, realising that war was certain to come, the Thebans were anxious to get control of Plataea first, while it was still peacetime and war had not actually broken out. Like all Greek city-states, Plataea, even though a small polis, had competing factions within it. One of these factions was sympathetic to the Thebans, or perhaps more accurately, they saw helping Thebes gaining influence of Plataea would lead to their faction gaining power in the city. We hear that an invitation from this faction would be extended to the Thebans, where they would ensure access to Plataea would be given to them if they march onto the city. Some 300 Thebans would conduct a night march across the plains and a Sopus river that separated the two cities. The Thebans had come armed, so once inside, they would be able to take control of the city by force if needed. Once the 300 men had arrived on the outskirts, they were met by one of the faction leaders, who would have the gates open to them. However, it appears once the Thebans were inside the city, the interests of the Plataean conspirators and the Thebans departed. The conspirators had arranged a list of houses for the armed men to attend, where their opponents lived. Obviously, this was a step to seeing the faction currently in power removed, opening the way for a new faction. Though the Thebans were not interested in internal Plataean politics, they had proved useful to gain entry, but their aims were in taking control of the polis themselves. The Thebans would make for the marketplace, where they would then rest their arms, and with more and more people now aware of their presence and gathering around, they would issue a proclamation. Their aim in this was to try and gain control of the city under reasonable terms, without using force. Thucydides tells us that a Theban herald would proclaim, all who are willing to return to their proper traditional place in the League of All Boeotia should fall in with them in the marketplace. It seems the appearance of the Thebans within their walls and assembled in the marketplace had come as a shock to many of the Plataeans, and through shock and fear, we here were ready to accept what was being offered. At this stage, a great amount of confusion was taking place in the darkness and the rumours of what was taking place certainly circulating. However, while negotiations were taking place in the marketplace, it was noticed that the Thebans were not present in the numbers that the Plataeans first thought. Behind the scenes, the Plataeans now saw that if they arranged a resistance, they would be able to overpower the relatively small number of Theban troops, with this being the preferred response since the majority of them did not want to leave the Athenian alliance. The Plataeans now put a plan of attack into action, where they would use the buildings and streets to their advantage. They would now surround the Thebans in the marketplace by cutting holes through the walls of the houses and buildings, where they could move between them and around the Theban positions unnoticed. As well as this, they would also block many of the streets with carts and other items proving useful barricades. With the preparations made, they waited until just before dawn to use the darkness to their advantage. Once a signal was given, once a signal was given, they would sally out from the various buildings surrounding the marketplace and fell upon the Thebans, where fighting broke out. The Thebans were thrown into surprise, thinking that they had negotiated a peaceful takeover of the city. They, however, quickly realised that they were in a bad position, being attacked on all sides in a city unknown to them. They would close their ranks to defend themselves better and attempt to fight their way to the exit of the city where they had entered it. We hear they would repel a number of assaults on their position while trying to withdraw all the while having roof tiles raining down on them from the women and slaves looking down upon the streets. Added to this, it had been raining all night, and all these various elements had now taken their toll on the Thebans. They broke formation and began running through the streets to find a path to safety. 
This breakdown in discipline would prove to be the downfall of most of the Thebans. The gates where they had entered had been locked and the scattered men were now being picked off by the Plataeans, who knew the streets well. There would be one sizable group of Thebans who managed to maintain some form of discipline and would rush into a large building that was part of the city walls, thinking the doors were gates where they could exit the city. The group would be trapped inside as the Plataeans had seen them enter and now discussions took place on what the fate of these men should be. A proposal had been made that the building should be set fire to, but eventually the Plataeans demanded the Thebans surrender. The Thebans trapped in the building, as well as those that had not yet been cut down in the streets, would hand over their weapons and surrender to the Plataeans. A larger Theban force had been assembling back in Thebes during the night operations to support the small force. Their function was to act as a reinforcement if anything were to go wrong inside Plataea. However, once news of what was taking place in the city got back to Thebes, the reinforcements would not be able to make it there until it was too late. The rain had flooded the Esopus and the fields around, making the progress very slow. What would take place next would be a he said, she said scenario that Thucydides presents. Supposedly, Thebes would present that they had the intention of taking Plataean citizens and the property outside the city walls captive, so as to negotiate the release of their own captured troops. However, the Plataeans preempted this move and had sent a herald to the Thebans, warning them if they continued their march, then the Plataeans would execute those Thebans they had held. However, if the Thebans would withdraw from their lands, they would release the prisoners back to them. According to the Thebans, this agreement was also ratified by an oath. However, the Plataeans would argue that this is not how events unfolded. They say that no oath was given, and they present that the negotiations were still ongoing. Though the Thebans did withdraw from Plataean territory without doing any harm, while once the Plataeans returned within their walls, with all the property from the outlying areas, they put to death their Theban captives, of who there were 180 of. Why the Thebans were put to death is not clear, however, one can imagine emotions would have been running high with the events of that night. Plus, there was no love lost between the Plataeans and Thebans. Athens would learn of what was developing up in Plataea as a messenger had left the city when they were first aware of the Theban presence. While another would be sent just after the Thebans in the city had surrendered. So Athens would have the picture of what had developed up to that point. The Athenians would send a herald to Plataea with a message informing them that the prisoners should not be harmed at this stage until Athens had a chance to advise on the situation. Athens would also take the step of issuing orders that all Boeotians in Attic territory should be arrested, sensing something larger was developing. With it also apparent, this attack by Thebes was a clear breach of the peace that had all but yet collapsed by this stage. After the Athenian herald's mission to Plataea, Athens would have been aware of the execution of the Theban prisoners. This seeing them take measures to protect Plataea from further inevitable attacks from the Thebans. An Athenian force would march to Plataea with full provisions for the city and would set up a garrison. The remainder of the Athenians would then escort the women, children and men unfit for combat back to Athens. It was clear from this action that they expected Thebes would be out for blood and all within the walls of Plataea would be treated as hostiles. So, with this action of Plataea in 431 BC, we would see the point where Athens now took the view that they were in a state of war. The attack had been a clear breach of the Thirty Years Peace, with it virtually impossible to argue any technicalities this time around. Thucydides would tell us it was at this point where Athens would now prepare for war, while the news of events would have travelled back to the Peloponnese, where the implications would have been all too clear, and we hear Sparta and the Peloponnesians now on a war footing. The Peloponnesian War had now begun. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the Support the Series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time where we continue the narrative in the series 
with episode 73, The Causes of War.